I saw my job really to give an overview. Uh, some of you may be aware that there's a big focus uh, through the National Port Board on cell lifetime productivity. And you, I'll give you a bit of history of that during this talk. So I see myself as really fronting the next two talks and saying a little bit about where the program come from in the context of, of the modern industry. So that was the, the title I was given risk factors, and I guess, I mean, one can make endless comments about cell performance. Uh, I just looked a bit at the history. Uh, genetic selection, as absolutely every genetic company will show you an improvement line of total pigs born per year. Uh, some companies will show you an increasing line of total live born per year and even total wean per year. So those lines continue to increase in our dam lines because of genetic selection. But in most of those dam lines, until, certainly until about five years ago, that trait of increasing total born and increasing wean was negatively associated with an average decrease in birth weight and quite often with an increasing gap between total born and total wean. So there was something going on that we were getting more pigs but in particular, the quality of the pigs was changing. And that really led, companies now are very focused on quality. So recent selection programs are tending to co-select for birth weight at the same time as continuing to increase uh, total born or total weaned. So things are changing and, and, and the real focus here is, is quality rather than numbers. And the National Port Board and uh, the Port Checkoff Program, I think, also recognize with the industry in the U.S. that this whole question of quality and cell lifetime productivity uh, is an issue. And so this is the definition that the National Port Board adopted to their program, the total number of quality pigs, and that's quality wean pigs, and there's a cutoff weight to define quality wean pigs. So the idea is to try and do something about litter quality but also to do something about lifetime productivity. And so all the projects involved in this program not only measure input variables, but are destined to measure at least three parities worth of productivity as a measure of potential lifetime performance. Um, this is a slide from Joaquin Spohe, who is in the audience this morning. And this was, I mean, the sort of uh, information that a number of us, uh, in fact a large group of people, have been taking around the world in the last 10, 15 years. And really, when you summarize all this, what it's saying is what goes into the herd in terms of young females is incredibly important in terms of lifetime productivity. So if you look at all of those statements, it's focusing us on the fact that the young female is a very critical part. And the other thing in terms of economics is you really need about, three lit you need about three liters worth of output from a sow to pay the input costs of the gilt. So, so that's, I think, established views of how things go. So I could spend the next hour and a half talking about retrospective analysis about risk factors. But it seems to me that's a pretty negative thing to do, sort of start looking at the damage in fifth and sixth parity cells and worry about that and argue about why they died or why they got lame. So I think that is actually another very productive title. What I'd like to talk about is what is the proactive side? What is the proactive management that will remove those risk factors and actually take us to a situation where we don't have to worry so much about the risk factors because we control the input. And rather than me talking about risk factors, I'd like to represent this blueprint team. Uh, there's a series of articles in the National Hog Farmer that the team involved in the National Hog Farm, in the National Port Board Program put together. And if you go and refer to that, you'll find a lot of detail that I won't be able to address this morning. So looking, uh, at the team, those are the series of articles that were written, and Billy Flowers and Jeff Valea here uh, represented a day in terms of the programs, and several other aspects of, of the team 
um, are involved in the actual research projects that have come out of this sort of review of the current status. So I'm representing really the input of this team and you'll see their names on several of the slides I present. So I also did a lead article for that series and these are just a few comments from that lead article um, that really uh, the best systems are achieving much of the genetic potential. So for those systems that are not, there's, there's no excuse blaming the genetics or the potential. It is there and it can deliver. So really we're talking about management factors and still trying to identify the key management factors that stop us realizing that potential. The risk factors, of course, you can identify where people aren't achieving that potential, then of course you can try and identify the risk factors. So this is a statement from uh, the, one of the articles again in that series, and I just want to come over here so I'm close to a, my, my timepiece so I can keep track of where I am. And really, again, looking at the, the sort of summary that Joaquin Sporhey put together, we're still back in the same place. Reproductive failure, soundness, if you like, of the young female is all coming from what we put into the herd. So the first part of this statement is, is what goes in really causes or removes most of the risk. And these are three sort of topics. Jenny Patterson presented a similar list earlier in the week at one of our workshops. But I'd like to sort of briefly in the context of the Blueprint series and the current project look at this question of consistent supply of quality gilts, uh, focus on the early breeding of those gilts, the early sort of gilt breeding and first parity, and then a, a few comments about involuntary versus voluntary culling. So I think we are at the point where if you try and do a cheap job, you don't set a facility up and you don't hire the people to manage guilds, I think it's very clear it doesn't work. There's no cheap way of doing it. I think it's such a massive investment in terms of the performance of a herd that it just amazes me that some systems won't make the necessary investment. And I think in the article I wrote, I mean, I did accept the fact that I assume that is not done because that investment is taken somewhere else in the system, and particularly in an integrated system. There may be, may be thought there's better use for that cash investment. Or I, I do totally accept that in, in, in a concept of least cost production, perhaps on a strong market, you can do a, a reasonably mediocre job and still make money. So that, that's a business case you can't argue with. I still think you can do a better job. I would like to think you can make more money. But if you're going to do it properly, uh, one of the things that uh, Joe Stock and Ken Stoller pointed out, again, in terms of reproductive development, I mean, there are some external signs that, that should be part of the process evaluating guilt. Uh, things like looking at vulval development, there are some abnormal vulvas. This is fairly normal. This is clearly a problem. So as part of the pre-selection process, you can actually screen out potentially infertile females, and that is mentioned in the articles. Um, in our program of guilt development, we actually have a wall chart that we, we get producers to use, and by looking at this series of events linked to this series of behavioral events, I think you can very nicely track the onset of puberty, if you like, the heat no serve event in a guilt. So we, we actually place a lot of value on people knowing how to do that. Now, we have already been criticized in submitted, submitted articles about our projects about scoring vulvas is nothing to do with reproduction. It's a complete waste of time. But, I mean, we, we, we would choose to disagree because I think if you have a good system like this, a good stimulation system where you're getting a lot of fence line contact, a lot of direct contact, and you actually record those events carefully, you end up with data sheets that look like this. And what you'll see in these data sheets is the, the two, three, four are all vulval development. So any twos and threes on here 
are records of vulval development. If you see a five, the only way the gilt can score five is that she's showing standing heat. So it doesn't matter how big the vulva is, what you think the gilt is doing, unless she shows a full standing heat, she can't score five, okay? And as soon as she does score five, you'll see a record of a weight. So this is a weight in pounds. One day we'll all go to kilograms, but this is the weight of the gilt at heat no serve in pounds, okay? We expect all of those records for every gilt that goes through the system. And again, I don't believe there's any cheap and easy way of jumping, avoiding doing this. Why do I say that? Because if you look at an animal like this, there are six days here of vulval development. You look at an animal like this, but neither of those animals stand. So there is a disconnect in some gilts between they start to develop vulval development. We've killed them. We know they may be cycling. They will ovulate and cycle, but they don't show a standing heat. And if they return 21 days later, you'll see the same scores of three again, but they still don't show a standing heat. And the simple fact of life is it's pretty hard to breed a gilt that doesn't show a standing heat. So we need to segregate these things. And I think only by having a good system and having good records can you get that sort of quality. So you can go through a series of statements that selecting gilts that cycle well, cycle predictively, sorry, uh, cycle predictively. Uh, if they don't cycle, our view, and we discuss it in the workshop uh, on Saturday, I mean, I see PG600 or a similar tool as pretty essential to keep the gilt flow going, particularly if we get health problems, uh, some seasonal problems. It's a pretty useful tool. And we showed quite a bit of data, I'll show you in a minute, to say this isn't a serious problem as long as it's part of an established GDU program. These are some data from Jeff Vallee, who will be speaking later. There's been a big trial. This represents over a 1,000 gilts. These were taken through a very healthy flow. So the histograms are the heat no serve responses, and I don't think we'll ever repeat this, these gilts were heat checked and given direct bore contact from 160 to 260 days of age. And I don't think anybody is ever going to put that study together again. What it shows you is very interesting. And Jeff did a very interesting analysis showing, in fact, that this overall distribution, which you can see is skewed out here, is really three distributions. A distribution of early responding gilts, and then a second group, which are mid-responding, and then a late pubertal group here. Overall, by 260 days, about 96% of the gilts had shown a standing heat, which I think is a very interesting figure, because we're often asked of the total number of gilts that go on stimulation, how many should we be selecting? I've always guessed that somewhere between 5 and 10% are relatively infertile, this data set says 6% after 100 days of heat checking have still not showed a heat. So I think we can take 5% out of the selection expectation. And in our program, we would think that we'd be taking a fair number of these animals out of the selection program because they just take too long to come into heat. And as you'll see, they get too heavy. So... In an induction program where we're trying to do the selection program more efficiently, then really we're selecting this population of females, and these, we would argue, would not be select females. They will cycle if you wait long enough, but we would argue they should not be select females. In the program that we have run uh, at Holden Farms, just south of here, again about a 1,000 gilts worth of data, these are natural cycles in green, and these are the cohort of gilts that were induced to cycle 23 days into the induction program using PG600. So depending on the cohort, we may or may not have to use PG600, but there's about three, I think three or 400 gilts here that were induced with PG. And you can see essentially what we've done is recruit this cohort and we've pulled some of these mid-responders back into this cohort here so these are really the select gilts 
in a 30-day program like that, relative to what we now understand a thousand gills heat checked for a hundred days would actually do. If you look at the performance of those, it's very high. That's just the production data showing that the, the whole thing, like days from puberty, are very obviously later for the PG because they're not stimulated until 23 days of the program. But you can see by the time we get to age at service, it's very similar, 220, 223 days at service, and they were bred somewhere between second and third estrus because of the, 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 the cell farm program. If you look at their performance, uh, shown here in two different ways, I think you can see the benefit of a good program. So two th just over 2,000 naturally induced gilts delivered into the system, about 741 induced with PG600. Of those, 97, 98% were actually served at the South Farm, and here it's about 96%. So, superb performance. I mean, the South Farm is not guessing about what gilts will be available to breed. They know exactly how many gilts they'll be able to breed. And again, if you look at the subsequent performance, if we go here, probably this is of gilts delivered, and you can see the firing rates with single service and repeat breeding. And if you come all the way down here to firing at parity four, you can see that this is really excellent retention to parity four. So it works. This is North American data a year ago. Uh, I mean, all of this is possible with a good program. So again, where are the big risk factors? The risk factor is not managing gilts. Nothing to do with what the gilts may or may not do later in their, in their careers. In terms of uh, lifetime productivity, in terms of numbers produced, these are the, the litters from those gilts. We'd like to get rid of this. I think in all of our recommendations these days, we say we'd like gilts to have a good first litter sign. We, we would like not to see a second parity dip. We're still seeing that with these gilts. But again, the lifetime performance is not affected by natural or PG heat and over three parities, I think is quite respectable. Focusing on early breeding then, uh, uh, I'm not going to deal with this because Jenny Patterson will be speaking in a couple of talks time, but this is a summary that Billy Flowers did to the Blueprint series and a number of sort of new things here that Jenny will be focusing on. Not only the, the early conditioning of the gills is important, but uh, as many of you will know, our group has been very interested in commercial sows and in breeding sows about this question of litter of origin. There's tremendous variation in litter birth weight in modern cell populations, I think, again, as a consequence of selecting for prolificacy. And I, I think it's something we have to deal with, and I think at the level of guilt management in, in our part of the NPD project, we're looking at litter of origin and seeing what sort of impact it actually has on guilt performance. So you'll hear more about that later. In terms of talking about breeding state, when we talk about where do we want the gilts at breeding, again on Saturday we were reviewing a lot of these benchmarks. Uh, I think we're all sort of more or less on this same page, uh, probably go higher at the top end here. If we look at why, uh, data out of Brazil uh, showing from Fernando Bertolozzo's group, who I think is in the room today, they did some excellent studies, in this case looking at weight ranges and showing retention by three parities, there does seem to be a risk if we get animals too heavy. And again, looking at the reason for that, a slide that Jenny showed on Saturday, that locomotion problems shown here seems to be the key risk factor in terms of getting animals too heavy when they're first bred. So uh, uh, we sort of worry about overweight at breeding, I think is something we worry about. Looking then at the relationship between age at puberty in the Holden Farm study, the, the data I just showed you, about 1,500 gilts in this data set, if you look at age at puberty versus lifetime growth rate at puberty stimulation, which is about 160 days in this case, you can see there is a slight negative, significant negative correlation suggesting that the faster growing gilts are in fact cycling a little bit earlier 
So there does seem to be some residual effect of good growth performance. The cutoff line here is the threshold that was established from the early literature suggesting any guilt that grows below 600 grams per day lifetime is at some risk of having delayed estrus. But in fact, this represents, I think you'll see on the, the prompt here, it's about, only about 8% of the population. And looking at the distribution, it doesn't really suggest that it's having a big impact on age at puberty. I mean, there are, there are guilts here with that low growth performance that are cycling early. There's probably a little cohort here that may be delayed. But it's not a major problem, but guilts, if you feed them to appetite, are growing very well. This is a total commercial facility that had been in commercial nurseries, commercial grow finish, and then came to the GDU where the weight was measured. But if you look at when they were actually bred, we had a fair number of gilts in this program that went through to third estrus, and of course, if they've got good growth rates, then we've got a range of weights here that we would probably consider are getting a bit too high. We would sort of worry about that. And yet when, he, when Jenny went back retrospectively and analyzed based on growth rate less than 600, 600 to 750 and greater than 750, I won't go through all the data, but basically there's virtually no difference between those different growth rates. So it looks as if even if you've got quite big differences in growth performance, at least out to three parities, if you manage the gill well going into the herd, it doesn't seem to be a massive risk factor. Now, parities five, six, seven, whether we'll see more lameness and removal problems will be an interesting question. These are coming back to the, the data set that Jeff Fillet's group put together, and that the guilt flow that I showed you early on with this sort of three populations and 100 days of stimulation, that was a very, very healthy flow and in fact, to do that study, those gilts were taken to a very, very clean research facility. They grew like crazy. So if you look at the cutoff line of 600 grams compared to the data I just showed you, I mean, there are virtually no gilts in that population of 1,000 gilts that are growing less than 600 grams. I mean, they're growing like crazy. And at the top end here, I mean, we've got gilts here. I mean, they're getting close to a kilogram a day. I mean... So the worry is overweight. If we get this sort of health status in the flow and we're not getting disease challenges and they're fed to appetite, what I did as part of the discussion of this paper working with the co-authors, we plotted here the line that would represent gills that were more than 140 kilograms that heat no serve. And so obviously if they're growing very, very quickly, even if they cycle early, They'll still be 140 kilograms, and as they get older, uh, and our growth rate is lower. But everything above this line, all of those gills are at a serious risk of being over 150 kilograms if you bred them at the next heat. Okay? So in terms of our definition of risk factor, the biggest risk factor is our gills increasingly growing fast and tending to get heavy if we don't manage them early. And the big question that Jess program is looking at under the National Port Board Initiative is can we go back and address a question that a number of us have been raising, in fact, for probably 10, 15 years, that if we're not going to restrict feed physically, then we need to find nutritional ways of restricting the growth, if you like, conditioning diets that remove some of the growth performance from our replacement females. And Jeff will be talking about that later. Um, one or two thoughts about lactation management, which I think are pretty intriguing. This is from the uh, chapter that, that Natalie Trottier. Natalie is working with Jeff to do various measures, but just a couple of comments to trigger, I hope, hopefully, some interest. Uh, if you look at lactation management, then you have mammary uh, quarters, teeth that are not stimulated, during the first lactation, then what you're able to show in carefully controlled studies is the performance of those mammary glands for the lifetime of the sow is compromised. So 
I think Dan Bread in, in, in Denmark can take a lot of credit for pounding at us about loading, loading gilts with pigs. That every teat that a gilt has available needs to be lactating in the first lactation. Okay? And I guess the Danes in particular have pounded that information at the North American industry. Even more intriguing to me is some, some data that Natalie has in her paper. This is looking at the impact of not suckling a teat just for the first 24 hours. And she was talking about cross-fostering and the importance of cross-fostering as early as possible to get the teats functioning. And what she shows here is that if the teat is not suckled in the first 24 hours, the unsuckled teat actually underperforms for the whole of the rest of lactation. So again, showing something very important, not only about mammogenesis, but about lactogenesis, getting the gland, producing milk. And I guess from my experience and as a sort of comparative physiologist, there's lots of good examples in the dairy industry about the importance of making a heifer lactate heavily in the first lactation and how much that affects her lifetime milk production. So very good parallels in the dairy industry that would focus on the same thing. So just some interesting stuff that's being, again, monitored in some of the projects we're doing and may produce some very interesting data. So I'd like to finish up then. I think I'm having started a couple of minutes late. I think I'm about on time. Um, just in involuntary, voluntary culling, because this always becomes a big debate about risk factors. Why are sows coming out of the herd? And just a couple of thoughts. Uh, again, coming back... Uh, to feet and legs, what do we know about feet and legs? Again, Ken Stoller had a, a very nice presentation in the Blueprint series, something I guess he's been promoting for years, looking at confirmation, a critical part of guilt selection. Uh, given that most op big operations now have their nucleus multiplication in-house, then of course we don't rely on genetic companies to do this for us anymore. It's an in-house function but it needs to be done properly, and Ken has these very nice charts suggesting exactly how it should be recorded, and again, basically saying there needs to be a record. I mean, somebody should be scoring this process and putting a score on a bit of paper. I mean, just to say, yeah, confirmation okay, confirmation poor. I mean, his argument is score it properly, make sure the people can do it, and get good results. And... Mark Wilson's in the audience, and I would give Mark and Ken Stoller between them enormous credit for pointing out to us that lots of what are recorded as reproductive failures, the tick in the box is fail for reproduction, but they keep reminding us that a lot of those sows are chronically lame, have got feet lesions, claw lesions, and it's probably all the stress of the claw lesions that actually probably stop them standing, stop them staying pregnant. So again... A critical factor, I think, still the analysis would say overlooked in the industry. And at least at the beginning of the process, we can try and remove the suspect animals. And finally, some thoughts about voluntary culling. Um, if you look at the sort of data I showed you on guilt performance, and you can take that out to the weaning, you know, rebreeding of the first parity female, it seems to me it almost gets to the point if you've got so the 95% of the sows in heat within five days, and you can achieve a 95, 96% firing rate of those weaned sows. I mean, I'm just asking the question here, isn't it easier just to cull the ones that don't get pregnant? And the secondary question, if you rebreed them, do you ever carefully analyze the results that you get from those rebreedings? Because when you do that, they're not very good you'll find a rebred sow is not a particularly good value proposition in terms of producing litter. So just the thought, if we've got excellent production, perhaps there's a different way of culling. And the second one in terms of criteria for culling will be litter size. I mean, do we cull for low litter size? Nothing we do in the gilt development actually guarantees that these animals' lifetime will produce big litters. They have the genetics, but the question is, will they do it? And some of you may be aware of these sort of data. I mean, you'll see their, their old data. If you look at total born here, their old data. This is from uh, Brazil, uh, from a review that I got access to. 
And these data are basically showing the apparent impact of first litter size on lifetime production. And basically arguing first litter size will be predictive of lifetime production. A similar set of data from Europe, from Sander Edwards, again from the same review, and again apparently saying the same thing, that the really low litters seem to be productive. Jenny Patterson, in a big data set we had from Canada three or four years ago, did a similar analysis, and the top slide looks very similar. This is classifying high, medium, and low, low litter size ranked on the basis of the first litter, and that looks very similar to the two slides I just showed you, except now we're up at an average of about 14 pigs. So it shows you what's happened in the last 20 years. We have about three or four more pigs in the equation. But interestingly for us, when Jenny reanalyzed the data using second litter size as the basis for ranking them, there's actually a much bigger separation here out to third, fourth, and fifth parity, suggesting that if we are going to cull for low litter size, perhaps it's more predictable, at least in this population, if it was done possibly on two litters worth of data or focus on second litter performance. So this might be something to do with lactation, lactation management, and why that lifetime affects the cell.